that's in those plants in the plant cell also has an enzyme sitting beside it in a separate little cell within the plant uh, or a, a little sac called morosinase. When you bite or chew or cut one of those cruciferous vegetables, the morosinase enzyme acts on this other molecule. Dr. Christine Houghton, I am so excited to have you on the Root Cause Medicine podcast. How are you? Oh, thank you, Carrie. I'm delighted to be here. Yes, um, I'm very well, thank you, even though it's very cold here in Brisbane, Australia. <laughs> on the we're opposite used, we're end not of used the world. To that. <laughs> no, I've only been to Brisbane once and um, it was warm and humid and lovely actually when I was there. It was quite nice. So I'm imagining if it's cold, it's probably not all that fun. <laughs> we're managing. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about my absolute most favorite topic um, and my favorite, I guess I would say, uh, product or phytonutrient, which is sulforaphane. And you are absolutely the first person to teach me anything about sulforaphane. Uh, years ago at a conference when I was, I learned about you, I'd been following your stuff. And then I actually got to meet you in Australia a couple of years ago. So I am so happy to talk about this because you're just a massive expert and I'm going to pick your brain for all the listeners. Let's go. <laughs> Before we get started, for those who don't know you, why don't you give yourself a little brief introduction, how you got into this, what you do, so they know. Okay. So uh, I was um, in clinical practice uh, as a nutritional biochemist for several decades, and I moved out of practice in 2004 and not really knowing what I was going to do, but Fortuitously, the science of nutrigenomics had just been named later that year. And I didn't know anything about that at the time. But as it turned out, um, I was just hunting through the scientific literature, trying to understand a little bit more about phytochemicals. And I discovered this thing called sulforaphane. And I discovered that some of the research that had been happening on this remarkable molecule goes back to the early 1990s. So I got myself very excited about that. And I realized, as we'll no doubt discuss as we proceed today, is it, it's really um, an opportunity to change gears in the way we think about nutritional therapy. And I think if I'd been in practice now, knowing what I know, I would have probably done things a lot differently from the way I did in practice. So I went on to do some further research and I formalized that and, and I did a PhD with um, my thesis essentially on phytochemicals, nutrigenomics and uh, special reference to sulforaphane, which like you is my very favorite food derived molecule. <laughs> I love that. For those who don't know, can you explain what nutrigenomics is? So nutrigenomics is two parts of a word, nutra as in nutrition, food, genomics as in gene or genome, essentially is food molecules that talk to our genes. So whereas um, we look at foods or we have traditionally looked at foods as carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins and minerals and so on. Now we're looking at the role of other molecules that come out of particularly plants, but any food. And these food molecules can switch on genes. And when they switch on genes or turn up uh, the potency of genes, if you like, we increase the expression of a whole lot of protective um, processes that are going on in our cells. So nutrigenomics then is the science which looks at food molecules and the way that they can beneficially uh, affect gene expression. And of course, if we choose the wrong sort of food, we can also turn down those protective genes and turn up the inflammation producing genes. Let's start with the basics. What, what is sulforaphane? How do we get sulforaphane? Where does it come from? So the, um, the cruciferous vegetable family, that's the, the broccoli and cabbage and... Um, 
cauliflower and, and that family of foods all contain uh, a category of molecule that we call glucosinolates. We're probably not going to mention that word again, <laughs> but, um, but um, that molecule that sits in those plants in the plant cell also has an enzyme sitting beside it in a separate little cell within the plant uh, or a, a little sac called morosinase. When you bite or chew or cut one of those cruciferous vegetables, the morosinase enzyme acts on this other molecule and that produces sulforaphane. Now that's a long answer to your question because there is no plant that contains sulforaphane. Um, you have to actually produce it on the fly. So um, this sulforaphane molecule was actually, we think, put into those plants by Mother Nature as the insecticide for the plant. So if you're a little grasshopper and you're nibbling on some cabbage leaves, let's say, the amount of sulforaphane that's produced as that grasshopper's nibbling is potent enough that it can actually kill the grasshopper but in a, in a human adult, 60, 70 kilos, whatever you weigh, uh, whatever that is in pounds, I don't remember, um, 130, 140 pounds or something, then um, it actually has a signalling effect because the volume of our bodies is too great to kill us, but it has this potent signalling effect. And it's those little signals that come from these plant molecules that turn on the genes. So let's continue the conversation. I know why I take sulforaphane because I learned it from you. Why do we care? Why do people need to pay attention, eat their brassica family, eat their sprouts, which we will talk about, um, or consider sulforaphane? What does it exactly do in the body? Well, let me just go back a little step. And I think it's true to say that practically everybody knows that the the cruciferous vegetables, brassica family of vegetables are good for us. Probably your grandmother said, eat your broccoli and so on and so forth. But we didn't ever, ever really know why. The beauty of this sulforaphane molecule, and it's not the only one of these protective molecules in this cabbage family, but it is the one that's been <clears throat> most studied and it has very, very potent effects. And when I say potent, what it does is it's activating switches within our cells they're actually called transcription factors but we'll just call them switches and those switches are pretty clever because they then are tied to hundreds of protective genes mother nature is pretty clever because if you look at these protective genes hundreds of them they're all pretty much grouped together by function so if you turn on this one switch in the cell you're turning on hundreds of protective genes all at the same time. So that's turning on all your antioxidant enzymes, all your glutathione producing enzymes, all your detoxification enzymes. And I can go on and go on and I won't. Um, but the message is the reason anyone would want to eat that family of foods is that you get uh, very rapid access to those protective processes in your cells. That's so, not the only way you can get it. Um, and I guess we'll come back to that later. But the sulforaphane is the one that's um, been researched now in about two and a half thousand <clears throat> public, published scientific papers. So there's plenty of research to support the story. So it's like when people see those um, like dominoes set up, you know, set upright in a row. And if you push the first domino, all the other dominoes fall after well, it well i kind of look at it like a christmas tree with all the lights on so we've got one switch on the wall oh. and say several hundred light bulbs on the christmas tree when you switch it on they're all on at once that's really what that's what the power of nutrigenomics is and that's the power of looking at particular food molecules that can activate those whole banks of protective genes I like that analogy so much better, <laughs> I, <laughs> mostly because I love Christmas lights. So is, is there ever a time you wouldn't want to support that or switch that on? Or is it generally always helpful for the human body, given what we go through? 
Well, in nature, the intricate processes which go on within human cells have all their own internal control processes anyway. So let's suppose you just really loved eating these brassica vegetables and you ate lots and lots every day. <clears throat> nature would know when you've activated those processes sufficiently and then that mechanism gets switched off. So it doesn't, say, doesn't stay switched on forever because of all these intricate feedback mechanisms. So the cells will go, okay, we need a bit more now. No, we don't need it at the moment. On, off, on, off. So that's the beauty of trying to access nature's processes instead of us trying to micromanage things. We don't have the ability to turn these processes on and off as required. We don't even know when the cells do or don't need more of this and less of that. Which is a huge take home point, especially for practitioners, because um, everybody wants to silo things, you know, like in my world, hormones, everyone's like, what's the one thing that will change estrogen? Let's say I'm like, the body doesn't work that way. It's, it's not the one thing. And it only goes in like a single sniper and deals with estrogen, right? It's, it's very system wide, which is why it's and very well controlled. <coughs> Excuse me, by and, the body. And yes, and this is what's changed in my thinking since I left clinical practice in 2004. I didn't realize how nutrigenomics worked. I mean, the term was only coined in that very same year. Um, and I think, you know, we were using individual nutrients to try to, to manipulate cell processes not realizing when and that's right outside of our scope above our pay grade as they say <laughs> um, whereas now when you switch on all these protective mechanisms at the same time you're also switching on the control processes as well so you put the whole machine on and step away and let nature do what she needs to do so speaking of nature broccoli versus broccoli sprouts when it comes to sulforaphane what are your thoughts okay it's an excellent question and i'm glad you've asked it <laughs> um, so if you look at a little broccoli seed which is a tiny little brown thing very very tiny <clears throat> it's that seed that contains the morosinase enzyme and it contains that precursor molecule which is glucoraphanin in the case of sulforaphane <clears throat> It can't make any more once that seed germinates and grows to produce a head of broccoli. You're essentially diluting those molecules within the broccoli vegetable. If you just harvest a sprout, which is only so many days old, you now have a fairly concentrated source of those molecules. So for that reason, <clears throat> those of us working in this field have come to realize that you can get 20 to 100 times more sulforaphane yield from a sprout that you'll ever get from the vegetable. So that's the reason that sprouts have become so very popular. The other thing that's worth, or a couple of other things worth taking into account, one is that the vegetables have been modified, let's say, over the years to make them last in the supermarket a lot longer. If you were growing some organic broccoli yourself, you might only find that three or four days in your refrigerator and it's starting to look a little bit old. Now you can keep modern broccoli in your fridge for a week or so and it still looks fine. So those varieties have modified lots of things to make them last, but they've also lost a lot of that potential to produce sulforaphane. So Sadly, you can't really rely entirely on the vegetable. I'm not discouraging anyone from eating the broccoli vegetable because I, I eat it for many other reasons as well. Um, but if you want that really therapeutic dose of sulforaphane that you, you, know, you can try to match the data in the clinical trials, you can't get it out of the vegetable. So that's you know, one of the other reasons that we use the sprout. The other thing that's important to note here is if you choose to grow your own sprouts, you'll buy some seeds from somewhere. 
the seeds can vary up to 40 fold in the content of those precursor molecules. You've got no way of knowing. The seed supplier typically doesn't know that either. It's almost never measured. Um, I mean, I'm in the habit of measuring this because I work in this field. Um, and it's well documented that the seeds vary greatly. So <clears throat> if you want to grow your own sprouts, you're going to get a wonderful fresh vegetable rich in folate and B vitamins and other phytochemicals and some sulforaphane, but you can't get a predictable amount. So if you, if you just want to grow your own sprouts because they're part of a healthy diet, by all means do that. But if you've got a particular condition and you think, you know, I've got such and such condition and I heard that sulforaphane is beneficial for that condition, you cannot rely just on homegrown sprouts because there's no standardisation of the dose. And when you look at the fact there's a 40-fold variation, um, you just don't get that reliability. That's so good to know. I grow, I've gotten a lot, I shouldn't say a lot, I've gotten moderately into growing my own broccoli organic heritage seed broccoli sprouts, but still take, oh. we'll get, we'll talk about supplementation. Um, but I still take my sulforaphane supplement because I didn't think there was guaranteed, you know, you will hear in, in the world, Oh, take in, you know, in us metrics, you will hear, take a tablespoon, take all you need is a pinch or take two tablespoons, yes. but it's a 40 fold difference between a seeds and B seeds and C seeds, then a pinch or a tablespoon or two tablespoons or whatever it is, you really honestly, you're saying, what you're saying is we really don't know how much, because none of us are testing, nobody's testing in just our homegrown variety. Yes, that's, that's the problem. And we just don't know. Okay. Is there a way to preserve? I've heard you talk about this before. I see it all over social media and I roll my eyes, but I'm going to ask you anyway, is there a way to preserve like the sulforaphane yield? For example, people will say blanch it or steam it or lightly fry it or um, eat it raw and all these. Is, does that any of that have any impact? Well, the moment you, the moment you raise the temperature, so steaming or what are you going to do with it, heating it? You're going to kill that morosinase enzyme. Uh, that enzyme uh, operates maximally at 60 degrees centigrade, and you're going to have to get over that to cook it. So whenever you cook it, you've killed the enzyme. So that's the problem. So ideally, you eat it raw. Um, and, you know, I often suggest to people, you know, I can't, you know, they'll say, I can't eat raw broccoli, it's yuck. All you need to do is crumble up the little florets and sprinkle them through a salad. You don't even know they're there. Let's suppose you made a casserole or a stir fry. The last thing you do before you serve it is crumble those little florets over the top, <clears throat> just like you might put chopped parsley on top of something before you serve it. So there's, there's ways that you can preserve that enzyme. Um, the other thing you can do, um, the Japanese white radish daikon is a good source of the morosinase enzyme. And if you grate that alongside your cooked broccoli, I don't know what dish this is. But, um, <laughs> I actually like Japanese white radish. Uh, I know a lot of people find it too hot and spicy, but that's that's one way to add morosinase enzyme. But again, it still doesn't let us know whether we've got the original glucoraphanin precursor in there. That's the thing that's largely varying 40 fold. Right. Okay. And the last thing about that, just because it's all over social media, mustard seed powder, you see people say, Oh, just chop, chop up your sprouts or chop up your broccoli or whatever it is and sprinkle mustard seed powder on it. Well, I'm deliberately mentioning daikon radish. <laughs> of course. Um, the problem we have with mustard, now I don't know what it's like for you in the US, but um, when I was doing my PhD research, I experimented with that and I thought, okay, we'll, we'll get some nice fresh mustard seed and we'll grind it up and we'll use that um, to get a greater yield of sulforaphane. To my horror, it made absolutely no difference. Mm. And when I explored this further, I found out what I think is the reason why. 
to bring any spices and herbs into this country, they have to be irradiated. And they're irradiated at 60 kilograys, which is one whack of a gamma irradiation dose. And that kills the enzyme. So I think that's the explanation for the mustard. And, and of course, why you need to do something like eat radishes at the same time, because you've now got a fresh source that's probably grown locally and not imported. I suspect the FDA probably regulates in the same way because there's so much concern about bringing in pests of some description from produce from other countries. So that's the answer to the mustard. I, I think it's going to fail. That's good to know. You do see it all over the place. And I thought, I'm going to have the expert on and I'm going to ask her. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's correct in theory. And if you can grow local mustard, we just don't appear to do that in Australia. We don't seem to grow plants like that. We bring them all in. And they're all fresh and fragrant and smell beautiful when you first open the pack. But that doesn't tell you what's going on inside. Right, right. Now, do you, are you a sprout eater? Do you eat sprouts? Yes, I do. I do. Um, periodically, I grow them. I don't grow them all the time. Um, there's a little bit of a caution for your audience about growing sprouts because um, we can get some pretty nasty microbes in sprouts. And every now and again, um, particularly in the US, there have been recalls on listeria, which has occurred in probably alfalfa sprouts, but it doesn't matter. The process is much the same. So I'm a little bit wary of the home sprout growing processes. I mean, typically, whatever you're doing, you would rinse them twice daily. When they're grown commercially, they, they, tend, they grow virtually on some sort of a conveyor belt type of an arrangement, and they're sprayed and drained every so many minutes. So you don't have the same opportunity to accumulate um, microbial species that you don't want to have there. Uh, and, it, and particularly mould is, is something of an issue. If you're growing sprouts, the better type to grow is one where you've got it in a jar where you can rinse and shake and mix it around. The ones that tend to grow on some sort of a tray and you get the, the roots embedding down into a, a, a mesh, if you like, they're the ones that are most at risk because the bugs love that and uh, they happily multiply, particularly the mold type species. And they don't necessarily smell moldy, but they're, they're growing in there. So just be careful. And I, I see that feedback. I have started, um, I use, I do the jar method and I have a stainless steel mesh cover. Some people say use cheesecloth instead. I just happen to have a, this mesh cover. Um, and when I rinse it twice a day, I then flip it upside down so that the excess water can flow out. So I have it upside down in a, in a bowl and knock on wood of the sprouts that I've made. Um, they have not turned out moldy. And when I've posted this, a lot of people write and say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize you had to drain the water and, you know, oh, as much as yes, you do. Yes, and yes, I, yes. so much so much yeah. mold. I, my sprouts always mold. And, and well, your method is the method that I would recommend. Definitely. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't come up with it. I definitely, you know, watched videos <laughs> on what to and, do. And really, in summer, carry I would probably rinse that more than twice a day if I mm. had access during the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's good to know because I am. I do go in and out like I said, of, of making broccoli sprouts because it's fun. And I have, well, they, I like the taste of them. I know not everybody does. And I love sulforaphane. So it's a nice little boost <laughs> on top of it, but I want to go. So let's say someone's like, I don't have a green thumb. There's no way I'm not growing sprouts. And there's a 40 fold difference between seeds. I want to take it as a supplement. Let's talk about the controversy that's out there around supplements because, oh my goodness. There's so much on the label. There's so much to choose from. There's so many people who swear their product is the best. And I have so many questions around this. Okay. <laughs> so the, the original supplements, which came out of research from Johns Hopkins University, were actually broccoli seed extracts. Now, at the time, they um, 
created this name called sulforaphane glucosinolate and, and they would say uh, two tablets of this product contains so many milligrams of sulforaphane glucosinolate. You see the word sulforaphane there and you think, ah, that's the one I read about. The problem with that is that that clever little term, sulforaphane glucosinolate, is a marketing term. It's not a scientific term. They created it instead of talking about glucoraphanin, which is the precursor molecule. So what they do with the seed, they extract the precursor, they kill the enzyme morosinase initially, and then they extract the precursor, which is the glucoraphanin. So you don't produce sulforaphane from that. Now, if you challenge the science on that, they say, oh, but you don't have to worry because the gut microbiota have morosinase-like activity and you'll produce all the sulforaphane you need. Nice in theory, a couple Maybe. of problems. <laughs> the first one is um, not everyone has intact microbiota. We don't know exactly what species have the morosinase activity. And you wouldn't know necessarily that you have the right um, proportions of the right bugs to do that. An even bigger problem is the fact that you're only going to get about 8 to 10% of the conversion to sulforaphane that you would get if you were to take the intact whole broccoli sprout or whole broccoli sprout powder. So there's the first problem, and, and that has raged for years. Um, to my mind, the, the most appropriate way to produce a product is not just starting with a seed. You actually grow the sprout. Uh, and keep in mind, these sulforaphane glucosinolate broccoli extracts are just extracted from the seed. They don't even grow the sprout. Um, the sprout costs more money to grow, of course. Um, but when you grow the sprout, you're actually getting the whole plant and you get all of the nutrients that came with that seed. So you're going to protect the glucoraphanin precursor, you're going to protect the morosinase enzyme, and then you get whatever other vitamins, minerals and phytochemicals came with that seed initially. So my approach is to look at the whole um, food as a source of sulforaphane. The reason a lot of companies don't want to do that is the morosinase is very sensitive and it's very easy to destroy it if you don't know how to process it properly. And so it's a much more complicated task to produce a whole broccoli sprout supplement that's got the morosinase retained as well as the precursor. And with that sort of supplement, as soon as it gets wet, let's say it's, it's been grown and dried and powdered and put into a powder or a capsule, as soon as that gets wet, the morosinase enzyme is going to attack the glucoraphanin and that produces the sulforaphane right then when you're taking it. Sulforaphane is not stable as a molecule, so you can't put it in your morning smoothie, drink half of it and come back at three o'clock and have the rest of it because you've, you've lost the sulforaphane. We normally say 10 to 30 minutes is about as long as you should just leave it in the glass and even 30 minutes is probably pushing it. So what's happened in more recent times is there um, are companies that are adding morosinase back to the glucoraphanin in a separate exercise. A lot of the labels don't very well disclose how much of what is there. And it's very hard to compare apples with apples, so to speak. You don't really know how much sulforaphane you get. And um, sometimes it's only two, three or four milligrams of sulforaphane out of a lot of these products. When you look at the clinical trials, you'll see that the doses that are used on average are around about 20 milligrams per day. So if you've only got a capsule that's producing two, three or four milligrams, you've got to take a lot of capsules. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of, some of the clinical trials are using more than 20 milligrams daily. They might be 30, 40 or even 60 milligrams daily. So it's, again, looking at this clinical trial data to try to understand what's practical for me to get this therapeutic dose if that's what I want. And, and I guess if you're a clinician, 
you really need to know that you're giving your patient a dose that's likely to have the effect that they had in the clinical trials. So more recently, there's another form of sulforaphane being produced. This came out of some research in France where they actually isolated the sulforaphane and because it's unstable, they've embedded it in a cyclic molecular structure that presumably protects the sulforaphane from degradation. So that's the more recent type of innovation. How well that um, mesh, if you like, breaks down, how well the sulforaphane is absorbed, I don't think we've seen any research on that. If there is some, I haven't seen it. So um, I'm still a little wary of that kind of molecule. Uh, I mean, my approach really is to look at whatever is nature compatible as far as possible. So um, the whole sprout answers that. And some of these other molecules may or may not do that. So when you're reading a label on a sulforaphane label, specifically like what words do you like to see what's well, first ideal of all, to you? I'll tell you what i don't like to okay. see <laughs> let's go there if if you see a product that says sulforaphane glucosinolate there's the first red flag don't go near it sometimes it's just abbreviated to capital sgs so that's just the extract no enzyme um, the, the other ones which really are a red flag are the ones that say contain so many milligrams of sulforaphane. So if it's claiming to be from a sprout or a seed and it contains sulforaphane, you know whoever put that product together doesn't know what they're talking about because no supplement contains sulforaphane. Now, for those of us in Australia, that poses a problem because our regulatory authority, the TGA, is much stricter than the FDA in this context. And if it doesn't contain sulforaphane, you're not allowed to put it on the label. So if you were to buy a product from Australia, you won't see how much sulforaphane. The label description might, on the back of the label, might discuss, you know, this product is a whole plan to you know, from which sulforaphane may be derived on ingestion, blah, blah. But you can't compare it because you can't say how much sulforaphane. So it's a pretty bewildering world, really. And um, makes it really hard for the consumer to try to determine whether they're getting a viable product or not. So I guess they have to investigate the company, have a look at their website, see if there's any clues on the website that give them some other guidance. If somebody is taking the time to grow the sprout and then encapsulate it in the process of growing the sprout and then if it, I don't know, pulverizing it to fit into the capsule, will that activate morosinase and therefore produce sulforaphane, but then by 30 minutes later, it's gone? Well, that's the trouble. As soon as you right. <laughs> pulverize it, you've yes. lost you've lost all their sulforaphane activity. So that, that's a problem. So you can't do that. Uh, and that's the difficulty, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for the manufacturer who's growing sprouts and drying them and wanting to produce a whole sprout powder, um, they have to really have their technique perfected. Otherwise, they'll kill the morosinase along the way. And I think some of the cheaper supplements that are on the market um, clearly have poor technique. It seems like a simple thing to do. Anyone can grow some sprout, uh, some sprouts. Uh, people have home dehydrators. They might go, well, I can do that. Uh, I can stick it in the coffee grinder, mill it up and have the powder and I'll just have a teaspoon in a glass of water every morning. Well, you can do that. But again, you don't know whether you've retained it or not. And there's another method where people suggest that you could freeze the sprouts as soon as you thaw out those sprouts, you're going to lose that activity. So, and even the process of freezing, because those little ice crystals that are going to grow as you freeze it, they're breaking up the cell structure. And when you break up that structure, the glucoraphanin comes in contact with the morosinase and it'll produce the sulforaphane. So I don't think freezing is really a viable option. The morosinase being an enzyme, does it get destroyed in our stomach acid? So if a company has put back in morosinase to try to add that to a supplement, but 
we swallow it into a very acidic environment, does it get does does, does it even have a chance to do its job with glucoraphanin? Look, I think it does. Yes, I do think it does. I think it it gets through the gut. There's enough clinical trial data to show that ingesting a whole broccoli sprout supplement certainly um, has measurable clinical effects and can be measured in the blood. So I think that's fine. Okay. Can All be right. Rescued. Um, what can be a problem though is if the morosinase is taken from a different brassica plant. So the 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 morosinases very subtly and um, you know if you've got broccoli um, sprouts and you're going to use a morosinase out of cabbage you don't necessarily get the same yield as you get if you just left the broccoli intact and that also probably applies to my daikon grated daikon approach as well because it's a different species but if you eat enough daikon you're surely going to overcome that limitation and every, every little bit, hopefully cross fingers, every little bit helps <laughs> mm. in the creation of sulforaphane. Okay. So with sulforaphane, you'd mentioned earlier about um, conditions or uh, research doses, 20 milligrams or 30 milligrams. What are some specific conditions or symptoms that make you think you could really benefit from sulforaphane? Well, I can just mention initially what the clinical data, clinical trial data says, and then I can talk to you about what we find uh, clinically amongst the clinicians that we work with here. So initially, some of the early studies were done looking at asthma um, and emphysema. So there were benefits in those conditions. And I think when some of the early studies were looking at people who were inhaling motor vehicle exhaust fumes and, and looking at benzene um, as a pollutant. And they were able to show that um, even those patients with um, asthma and, and emphysema were able to reduce the inflammatory response that was occurring. So there's those. Um, there are a couple of studies on autism. And this is interesting because while these autistic patients were taking their sulforaphane, and I think it was an 18 week study, there was significant benefits in many of the markers that one uses, behavioral markers in most cases, um, significant benefits. But after the 18 weeks and the trial was stopped, they continued to measure these effects for another month. And they showed that gradually the patient um, resume some of those mm. uh, behaviours, undesirable behaviours. So um, is that a cure? No, it's not a cure. Is that helpful? Yes, it's very helpful. And we know of many cases of clinicians who do this. The thing about the clinical trial is that, that I think really needs to be mentioned is the broccoli sprout was a single intervention. Now, no clinician would just take a patient with autism and just go here, take these broccoli sprout capsules without looking at diet and lifestyle and a whole host of other conditions. So the fact that they got any benefit at all, I think is quite remarkable. One of the other categories um, where this is helpful is in helicobacter pylori infection. And um, it's interesting that sulforaphane is a urease inhibitor. So what that means is the helicobacter organism produces an enzyme called urease. And urease produces ammonia in the stomach. Now ammonia makes the pH of the stomach, which should be acidic, more alkaline. And so basically the helicobacter bug is creating its own little environment in the stomach where it's quite happy and it survives like that. Um, and then that interferes with digestion, protein digestion, and a whole host of other things, mineral absorption, et cetera, as you know. So sulforaphane um, is a urease inhibitor. So by blocking that urease enzyme, um, that's the mechanism or the main mechanism that's thought to get helicobacter under control. Now, the clinical trials on that were using a higher dose. So they're using 35 to 60 milligrams. There's a couple of studies on that uh, to get an effective response. 
that therapy doesn't totally eradicate helicobacter. However, um, many of us don't see helicobacter as a complete pathogen that must be totally eradicated. What we need to see is that the gut microenvironment can manage organisms of that kind. Most of us have helicobacter organisms, but most of us don't have the symptoms. So uh, the sulforaphane is helping to bring that under control. And I guess what you're really doing is by improving the general cellular environment, you're improving the function of the gut throughout and, and other parts of the body at the same time. So in those cases, if someone gets benefit from taking sulforaphane and they have gut problems, uh, they're probably wise to stay on some sort of supplementation or sprout growing or whatever other means they have of getting that benefit. So the sulforaphane is specifically able to inhibit urease. We don't know whether other members of the cruciferous vegetable family do the same. And um, what I think is interesting as a, an addition to that is that there are many other microorganisms that produce urease as well. Uh, Klebsiella is one of them. And I think, um, uh, and so is Staphylococcus aureus. So I think there's a number of opportunities to get control of the gut microbiota population or the microbiome by using phytochemicals, which are having these sorts of beneficial effects. Absolutely. What about just general detoxification? Since this is the, helps flip the switch to uh, all the lights on the Christmas tree. Yes. What if somebody's working on hormonal detoxification or chemical detoxification or, you know, anything, any kind, anything that their pr pr practitioner has said, we got to open up the pathways and let's get you moving. Most definitely. Yes. So traditionally in herbal medicine, plants like St. Mary's thistle have been used to um, enhance um, detoxification, liver detoxification. However, when you look at the comparison between the effect of St. Mary's thistle and the effect of sulforaphane, the difference is, is just light years apart. And um, in a 2019 um, review paper that I published, which was called um, <laughs> Sulforaphane, it's coming of age as a clinically relevant nutraceutical in the prevention and treatment of chronic disease. I included um, a graph in there which actually compares the effect of sulforaphane in phase two detoxification pathways against a whole host of other plant molecules. Um, and it's crystal clear that the effect of sulforaphane is many times greater. And that's without even talking about the comparative bioavailability. So what that means is Sulforaphane, by the nature of its little molecule, it's a very low molecular weight molecule. <clears throat> it's like lipophilic, so that means it's attracted to fats in cell membranes. It's absorbed very readily, and very rapidly, whereas St. Mary's thistle is a, a polyphenol, and that polyphenolic molecule is big and bulky, and its bioavailability is less than 1%, and you'll see that if you look at the paper as well. So it's like pushing a barrow uphill to use some of these other plants when you look at sulforaphane. Now, again, you're not just going to have one plant on its own. You're going to have a mixed diet. You're going to get a whole host of these phytochemicals coming in on your diet, in through your diet. So it's not going to be quite as bad as 80% bioavailability versus 1%. Um, but I think the role of sulforaphane in liver detoxification and prevention of hepatotoxicity is very underappreciated. And uh, part of my reason in publishing that paper was to try to put this in the hands of clinicians so that they understand that the power of this little molecule. It's huge. It's and, and the plant or herb that she's referencing for those in the US is milk thistle. We commonly yes. do, right? That's right. And on the, all the ingredients on our labels will say mm -hmm. milk thistle and it's usually always the star player in any kind of liver supportive supplement that you take. Um, and so it's so nice to know, because of course, sulforaphane is my favorite. 
that it's leagues, leak, leap years, light years is what you said. Light years above yeah. it. Not that milk thistle is um, bad, but for bang for your buck, eat your Look, sprouts it's, and take it's yourself part of that traditional herbal medicine model yeah. that's been goes back a hundred or more years, whatever it is. We're just now looking at new science. Now, I mentioned earlier that sulforaphane didn't come to the fore until the early 1990s. So we've got 30 recent years compared <laughs> with hundreds of years of tradition. Yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, so with sulforaphane, um, we get the question a lot around those who have hypothyroidism. Everyone freaks out. Oh, my goodness. I don't eat any broccoli, cauliflower radish and Brussels sprouts, none of that, because I've been told that if I eat those foods, it will slow down my thyroid. And I don't want that. What are your thoughts on that? Um, what the science shows is that those goitrogens, which develop in the broccoli, vegetable and other crucifers only develop as the plant matures. So in this tiny little sprout, that's only harvested after a few days, it doesn't have time to grow those fancy molecules it also doesn't produce vitamin k so people with clotting issues go you know i'm not allowed to eat green leafy vegetables because of the vitamin k um, no none of this applies to the sprout what i would caution in terms of uh, thyroid function is people who juice kale because kale um, when juiced it's the mature leaf and it produces enormous amounts of goitrogens and you then have it raw. So you've got the morosinase in the kale leaf. You're producing these um, goitrogens right there or you're converting the goitrogens to um, the goitrogen. And uh, that's where a lot of risk comes. So no, the sprouts are perfectly fine. Which is good to know because I definitely, uh, I definitely get that pushback, especially on social media when I talk about sprouts it's it's my and i i understand why and i understand the confusion when it's my hypothyroid folks who jump into the comments and say oh, but not us not us we can't we i have we have thyroid issues we can't do it so and i forgot about the claudine i forgot about the vitamin k those who have been told not to do leafy greens that the sprout mm. doesn't doesn't make it doesn't have time to make that yet it's only it's only like a week old <laughs> it's not there yet well, so. the harvested at around about the time the little rootlet would be able to um, sustain itself if it's grown in soil. So they're not grown in soil. Um, they're grown virtually hydroponically. <clears throat> and the, the root needs, the root, the, the little plant, let me say that again, the sprout has to rely on all the nutrients it's getting out of the seed because it doesn't have a root structure to take nutrients in. So it has to wait till it's grown some little rootlets before it can take anything in from the environment. So what you have is all that's in that seed and nothing else. So when we produce sprouts, we don't use any agricultural chemicals at all. It doesn't need any pesticides because it's not grown out in the open environment. And it gets no nutrients because it couldn't use them even if we gave them to them. Okay, that's good to know. And actually, so speaking of this, are there other are there other chemicals that do the same? Are there other plant-based chemicals that have this kind of power like sulforaphane in the body when it comes to flipping the switch on your Christmas tree? Absolutely. So, <laughs> As a matter of fact. There are plenty of people who've lived happily in the world for thousands of years and never ate a cruciferous vegetable ever, I'm sure. So sure. how does nature do this? So nature does this because most of the phytochemicals, if not all of the phytochemicals in plants, are signalling molecules. And they are all collectively sending signals to the switches in our cell, which then ultimately talk to our DNA. So this is one of the main reasons that we recommend a diet rich in plant food across a wide diversity of different plants. So what you don't get out of this one, you'll get out of the other. So the wider the diversity, the better. Um, the other thing which compounds this, and it's not nutrigenomics, but it's part of the same story, it's exercise. Mm. So when you exercise, you are um, increasing your oxygen intake, you're producing more superoxide radical, 
that's a stress to the cell. And that stress says to the cell machinery, whoa, we're going to get into trouble here. If you keep exercising, you're going to produce more free radicals and we're going to be in trouble. So switch on all of those protective genes. So you get that benefit out of exercise at the same time. So it really comes back to what might seem like a very trite recommendation, a healthy diet and healthy lifestyle um, really is how nature does it. So unfortunately, most people don't live that healthy lifestyle. And there's a very interesting study, which I often quote that comes out of Germany that looks at 600 grams daily of non-starchy vegetables has sufficient capacity to significantly reduce the inflammatory markers within the blood. So it drops into leukin-6, it drops TNF-alpha um, and a few other markers as well. So for those people who say, you know, there's nothing left in our food, it's all the soil's been ruined, da, da, da. Um, theoretically, yes, some of that has happened, but it is not so bad that you cannot rely on a diet with generous amounts of plant food to get the benefit that our health requires. So still eat your plants. <laughs> lots why, of plants. <laughs> lots of plants and exercise. Okay, well, given that this is the Root Cause Medicine podcast, and we have been talking predominantly about sulforaphane, but just the switches, nutrigenomics in our body, what are like your top one or two or three takeaways that you want everyone to finish out this podcast thinking about or knowing or or going and buying and gr or growing um, starting tomorrow? I think the important message is to understand that when we can activate these, these switches within our cells that are upregulating this bank of protective genes, what you're doing to one cell of the body, you're doing to every cell in the body. So you are getting a very broad, widespread benefit. And some people say, what's sulforaphane good for? It's good for everything in that sense. If your weakness is this condition, hopefully you'll see some benefit there. If the other person's weakness is in a different condition, they should see benefit there. So it's not a disease-specific approach. And I think that reductionist approach has crept into natural medicine. And it's very unfortunate because I'm more in favour of looking at um, managing these upstream processes that govern the normal function of every cell of the body. And the other thing that's worth pointing out that is as we get older, these mechanisms de decline in their activity. So we need to work harder at protecting ourselves than we ever did when we were younger. And to think that a bunch of antioxidant vitamins in any way could replicate what mother nature is embedded into thousands of phytochemicals which are the signaling molecules which activate our own defenses is just a little bit too much to be believed and, and when I was in practice and I did use a lot of those sorts of supplements that's the main thing that I would never do now because when you do give lots of antioxidant vitamins you actually switch off a lot of these signals that the cell needs to pick up, to tell it, to switch on its own defenses. And it's rely on exercise instead. <laughs> and diet. <laughs> and diet. Yes. A very, a very diverse diet. Oh my gosh. This is wonderful. I love that. I get to pick your brain today about sulforaphane. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Tell everyone where they can find you and how they can learn from you. Well, our company is CellLogic, C-E-L-L-Logic.com.au. <clears throat> We're based in Brisbane, Australia. Um, you'll find lots of information on the website. There's all sorts of articles about sulforaphane and so on. I'm fairly active in social media and um, I've, I've written a book called Switched On, Embracing the Science of Nutrigenomic Medicine. That's on Amazon as either the ebook or the um, paper copy. So, um, and that's got lots about the whole concept of nutrigenomics and sulforaphane and all the other good things that we can do to promote good health. I have it in my bookshelf, actually, right over there. <laughs> <laughs> so I own the book. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again. I am sure everyone listening who has had a lot of questions about 
maybe just Sprouts in general or the Brassica family or who know at the next level about sulforaphane will appreciate this deep dive. So thank you for being on today. It's been an absolute pleasure, Carrie. Thank you so much for the invitation.